Sam's going to talk to us, and um, this is going to be interesting. Okay, Sam. <laughs> Diana said that after all the misery and despondency across the road there, because really we know what's going on, we, we know the story, it's like we're in a Kafka play, right? All the lines have been written for us by somebody up there, probably the Prime Minister, Mr. Stephen Joyce. <laughs> so she said, well, make them laugh. Just one laugh. I said, okay. Here's this little story. You know Anne Brower? Yes. yes. She's not here, unfortunately, but we had a competition going to see who would get the most letters of the week in the press. She had about three opinion pieces, I had two. She had, I think, two letters, which were the best letters of the week, I had three. And that was how I was catching my salmon, because we couldn't catch it at the river. I'd write a letter, and as a prize, we've got to swear the salmon to the house. <laughs> <laughs> it was easier to write a funny letter than it was to actually go there and fish for the things, which were there anyway. Um, so I was sitting having coffee with Anne on a Tuesday, and I said, I bet you I can get Friday's best letter of the week. She said, you're on. I can't remember what we bet. It was relevant, really. I just wanted to beat her. It's very hard to do with her. And the letter, as I remember, it's a few years ago. The letter went like this. <laughs> Dear sir, yeah. last night, my partner and I made love and woke the baby. 30 minutes later, a 5.5 magnitude earthquake. <laughs> Rolled through the building. The baby didn't stir. <laughs> In the morning I went down and I sat there at breakfast with my partner and I said, what does that tell you about our relationship? She said, what it tells me is that earthquakes are common. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting pause, just before the comment and laugh. But then the editor rang me up and he said, did you really write that? I said, do, do you really want to lose all your friends? I said, no, I'll make some new ones, it's great. <laughs> so anyway, there's your laugh again. The rest of this is very serious, and I want you just to take it from them. What I tell you now is very personal, and let's start with Chekhov. Chekhov? Chekhov? A sort of highbrow? Is it too highbrow? Can I make a plea? Does, does anybody here have a pint of blood on them all? a little bottle or something, because we've got Bryce Johnson over here, he was expecting a steak. My personal worry is I've never seen so many beans <laughs> before outside of Blazing <laughs> Saddles. <laughs> <laughs> so Chekhov, yeah, where was that? Chekhov. Three sisters. Oh, is that good? <laughs> yes. Is it good? Because I go to our local library and I say, check off. And she, she says, bless you. <laughs> and I say, no, I say, I say you know, the man who wrote the plays, I want, I want the book, the kind of Sam Hunt kind of voice. <laughs> <laughs> and, she's, and I said, well, a book, she said, wouldn't you rather play on the computer? <laughs> so I want a real book. This is a library, isn't it? The same way, right? It's a library. So, well, we've got Harry Potter. <laughs> we've got, we've, oh, we've got Annabelle Langbein. You can learn how to cook something. <laughs> so anyway, check off. I finally got a copy from Diana, which is great. Thank you very much for that. It was a short story, and one of the stories is called The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Ah. Yes. I don't have to tell you any more, do I? <laughs> well, do you remember the story? He's a magistrate. I think he's in a province, or he's in Moscow itself. I'm not sure. He's a magistrate. And what he enjoys... Are you texting <laughs> She's my own Facebook. <laughs> Ivan Ilyich, right, he was a magistrate. And what he liked about his job is he was surrounded by office. He had the official vestments of office. He had people would come to him to make petitions on official paper. He had a secretary. He was divorced from the hoi polloi, the crowds in the street. He was the magistrate, they were, they, they were out there, and he had these layers between him and them. The layers between him and the sap of life. Isn't that a great term, the sap of life? That's us. And to my mind, it's Mr. Sane. He sits in this little office, and he writes his little inspirations on his wet dream paper, and he fires them. <laughs> He 
throws them out like paper airplanes out of his window. They sail around, they land. Where they land, they destroy our lives. He doesn't touch them because it's in this little tiny room, separate from us and untouchable. Until one day there's a knock at the door and there's Bronwyn Pruller. <laughs> and the shit hits the fan. Before that happened to Nick, he did that thing with Ecan, kicked them all out, and then he did this victory lap of the rural constituencies and he came to Ampling and said, oh, we'll go down and listen to what he has to say, it's going to be interesting. We went down there and he walked into the room and sat at the top of the table and he had Rodney Hyde with him. Do you remember Rodney Hyde? <laughs> Oh, what's he been, why is he being penalised by this guy? What's going on? And of course, Nick's a fairly short guy. Rodney's shorter. So Nick looked a little bit bigger. Plus, if you strap somebody onto you who has a lower IQ than you, right? So it works for Nick. It's great. He must have a great PR guy. Rodney Hyde came in and sat at the table. And his feet didn't quite touch the ground. And I'm sitting right here watching. His little black polished shoes are flapping around like a kid with a swollen bladder who's too scared to leave the table in case he misses something. But what struck me most was that Rodney Hyde was wearing a pinstripe suit. I thought, what, where have I seen this before? And I remember it's Al Capone, right? <laughs> and I figured it out. The dirtier the deed, the cleaner the suit. Yeah. The tide of, yeah, this is what Henry Thoreau wrote about when he said, Beware of enterprises that require new clothes. So here's Rodney. And of course, all that was wrong. What happened was a PR guy once said to him, Look, Rodney, he was dressing too relaxed without a suit. He was wearing a pullover like this in old jeans. He'd walk into press conferences. And the PR guy said to Rodney, Rodney, you know, with that head of yours so is shaped conically as it is like half a football, and then you've got that jersey with the roll-top neck, and from a distance you look like a circumcised penis. And when people call you a dick, it's not that they're being unkind, it's just that's what they see. And, I mean, like, walking around like that, you're going to lose the anti-Semites, and how's that going to help the act party? So, I'll let that sit for a while. So then Rodney and Nick, after they'd done the dirty deed around the table, they went off into an adjoining room beside the council chamber where we'd all been listening to them talk about their great victory and destroying democracy. They went into the small room to have a thing called a cup of tea. Now, remember the cup of tea with John Banks? There's one with Rodney Hyde. There's one probably with Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, can I get a cup of tea for you? A cup of tea for Judas? I'd rather have 30 pieces of silver, please. No, we do it with cups of tea now, Judas. Yeah. <laughs> so there in this little room, these guys are going clink, 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 and congratulating themselves. And as we walked out, we were stunned by what had happened. And we, none of us were speaking. We looked like mourners. Except for Joe Kane. And Joe Kane was amongst us. Do you know Joe Kane? Yes. A formidable woman. She swam straight once, maybe twice, with both legs and one arm tied behind her back, nibbling on sharks as she went. She could bench press Ronnie Hyde with one hand. She walks to the wee room with the eyes. It's true. You were there. Everybody's walking out, and she, and I thought, ah, there's going to be blood on the ground. And I followed her to the wee room. She opened the door. <clears throat> There's silence in there. All these guys, all these little men, sitting at the table, little cups of tea and the muffins, frozen in that one scene. I can see it. She leans in the doorway like, my Lena Dietrich on steroids. <laughs> and she looks down at these guys. She says to them, well, boys, if you can all go and get <laughs> Then she slammed the door and walked out. And that was the only cluster of words said in an hour and a half that were meant. <laughs> now, on the 1st of May, <laughs> the 1st of May is Alison's birthday. Every 1st of May, we head for somewhere far from the madding crowd. If it's raining on the coast, we go to the mountains. If it's raining in the mountains, we go to the coast. And we leave early, the stars are in the sky. We have Charlie in the back. And we head off away from our niche to some other niche where there's nobody, just the wind, maybe some tussocks, a piece of sand, some rocks, maybe. And every year, it's delightful and wonderful. There's a surprise somewhere. And two years ago, we went up to Arthur's Pass, thinking we'll have lunch at Arthur's Pass, and we'll walk up a wee valley somewhere and find paradise. We'll be by ourselves. It'll be great. 
But we have no itinerary on these days. And that particular made a flex. <coughs> we got to Springfield, and there was the sun <coughs> just painting the eastern hills with yellow. If it was painting the western hills, it would be Switzerland, probably. But, <laughs> and we coasted over the Porter's, Porter's Pass, and it was autumn. Everything was at its best, and at, at its worst on the way out, winter coming. There's still optimism in the air. We got to Lake Pearson. Lake Pearson? Is that your home, Scott? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we arrived there. Sorry, I didn't ask. <laughs> These days of ownership. <laughs> we arrived there, that little, and I said, hey, wait a minute, there's that little road that travels on the other side of Lake Pearson. It's well known to fishermen as Lake Self and Lake Horton. I've never been to Lake Horton. Is it Horton or Harden? Horton. I hadn't been there, I'd been all around it. I'd never been actually there. We drove down that shingle road just looking for adventure. We found a wee sign, and the sign was leaning back in the Norwester or a Norwester that had been on many occasions. And the sign pointed up the hill, so we stopped the car, we got out and we climbed that crest and looked over the crest and there in this lovely fold of hills lay a mile of beautiful tranquil water, this lake, Lake Horton, and we said, ah, oh, this is the place. And on that crest I turned around and looked back to where the Waimak was, and I couldn't see the Waimak because there were hills in the way, as you know. And a beautiful, a kind of, a kind of, a, a shallow place in the hills where once Bill and I, a friend of mine, when we were 20, 23 years old, we'd been washed off our rafts in the Waimak. You know how you get washed off rafts when it's in full flood and you're kind of stupid. And in the willows, I thought he'd died, but he hadn't, and he jumped out. And there we are, best mates, we lost, lost half of our gear in the water. We had to walk out somewhere. So we'll just start walking in that direction, we'll find something. It'll be a truck, it'll be a car, it'll be a train. And we came to this beautiful sort of crest and looked over and down. Below us, the setting sun was throwing one last line of light down and illuminating this one railway track. So we had this thin silver line go through the valley. And I thought, Jesus, this is what holds all the hills together. If that snapped, would the hills fall down? Would the lakes rise up and disappear to the sky? Would the rivers go loose? And that was how immense it felt. We walked down that hill and we struggled through the marshes. We got to the railway line and there we found a place to wait for the train and to flag it down. And there was one apple tree. We chose an apple and we started chewing on the apple. And I thought maybe this apple had grown from the core of an apple that was eaten by my mother, traveling up Parthas Path to stay where she lived. Because my grandfather was the station master there. And maybe she had thrown that apple core out and we were now eating it. You know, that's how it could be, that circular thing. I thought this is lovely. And then about nine o'clock around comes that long arm of yellow light from the train towards us. And Bill stood on the railway track with his arms out looking like a silver crucifix and the train came along and right past us jumps and And the conductor, whoever it's called in those days, leaned down from the caboose. G'day boys, he said. Where are you headed? It's <laughs> <laughs> Christchurch. You're lucky we're going there too. <laughs> <laughs> and we climbed on board and we're still wet from the river and we're a despondent. We lost half of our stuff and he said, we don't have any money. He said, it doesn't matter. We got him and he gave us a seat and on the opposite side of the carriage in the yellow light of the carriage while the sky was turning grey and the hills looked like cut out pieces of cardboard against each other. You know how it is. As the day fades and dies and we're in there, the light is the same on the outside as it is on the inside. And the other side this was a little old lady, about my age now, and she had her lunchbox with two sandwiches, which she gave to us. And those were the days when people still liked each other. <laughs> it was also the days when we could stop a train because it belonged to us. Before Roger Douglas and David Cable and his band gave everything away, and it still happened to be. So there we were on the first of this film, Ellie and I and Charlie with her invisible horse called Barney that she's leading along, and we made our way down to that beautiful stretch of water, Lake Horton. Remember we were at Lake Horton before I got into the white map just then? <laughs> and we, we found one bent willow tree, one beautiful bent willow tree, which sort of exemplified the roar of the wind through there, and the fact you couldn't tame that land if you wanted to. And at the base of the willow tree, I found a little divot, and I made a fire, because you've got to have a fire. You've got to have a fire, right? You do. You do. A fire centers you. A fire is what you sit around and you, you exchange stories around the fire. And we sat by that fire and there's a bumblebee fizzing like a dying firecracker in the dry leaves. And, and fire grew. A fire gives you optimism. In the winter, 
It warms you on the front and you're cold in the back. You lean towards it like, like a lover. You freeze and you burn. It's passion, right? The fire is not a heat pump. <laughs> you walk into a house with a heat pump. You walk into mediocrity. You walk into a sort of ambience. There's no centre. There's no, you can't boil a billy on a heat pump, right? <laughs> Do you remember at Dr. Zhivago and Lara? And they're galloping across that great big wide white landscape towards the darker where they'll be safe for a while. And there's the darker. And it's covered with snow and they arrive and it's just coming on night and they walk inside and they, the snow has drifted through the windows and it's drifted around the furniture and nevertheless they walk in there and they see the big fireplace and they find a big bearskin rug and they draw it up in front of the hearth and Chivago lights the fire and it starts to crackle and burn and then the fire reaches out its arms and pushes away all the pessimism in the whole wide world and at that point did Lara turn to Chivago and say Hey Yuri, put out the fire. Let's make passionate love in front of a heat pump. <laughs> he did not. Heat pumps are a fascist conspiracy to turn us into a passionate society. <laughs> that beautiful fire, Mr. Green, it's that beautiful fire. Had boiled our water by that stage. I've stopped telling myself that story. Had boiled our water. We took the, took the belly off and we. We dropped into it a handful of coarse ground coffee. And the settlement, you'd have to tap that billy with a green willow stick. It must be a green willow stick. And you give it a little bit of a twist. And then you put the billy back into the fire. So it can just chug a little bit. Just a little bit more. Then you take it off and it's about right. You have to pour that coffee then through an Andalusian silk scarf into two white chipped enamel mugs. <laughs> <laughs> and that is coffee. Coffee is not. What comes in a chrome machine you bought in Rome for $3,000? Knobs and levers all over, and two little penises hang down the bottom through which the coffee dribbles as, as if extruded from an inflamed prostate. <laughs> that is not coffee. Coffee is context. Coffee is a lake with two swans with curved necks, a lover by your side, a child with an invisible pony. <laughs> coffee machines? They're a fascist invention. <laughs> Designed to turn us into a passionate society. And that night, <laughs> and that night we drove home, and the stars were out by the time we arrived home. Charlie was already asleep. And we took her upstairs, put her to bed, and I lit the fire. And then beside me on the table was a letter from ECAN. It was none <laughs> open. <laughs> it was one more invitation to make. One more submission to a lost cause. <laughs> and all I wanted at that moment was, I wanted a cupboard, and in that cupboard I wanted a pinstripe suit, some black shiny shoes, 578 unopened letters from ECAM, which we've received over the last 15 years. Take that last letter, put it into the cupboard, before I close the door, so you can all go and get Close the door. Then walk over to the balcony, open that sliding door, stand on the balcony under the same stars with Boris Pasternak wrote those beautiful lines, how intense can be the longing to, to escape the emptiness and dullness of human verbosity, to immerse oneself in deep sleep, true music, nature, or human understanding made, made, made speechless. speechless by emotion. And that, I would say, would be the set of life. Any questions? And, and what was amazing about that that time was we felt we could do anything. Yes. You know, and 
really, I mean, we were engaged in interflat wars at the time, and we spent our time blowing each other up. And you could go down to the local store and buy a coil and blast and fuse and powder. And, and <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine rang my father's best friend uh, and, and said, because he was blowing rocks up in his place, and said, Can I please borrow some blast and fuse? He said, You don't borrow blast and fuse, you use it. You don't have a bag. And my friend was 15 at the time. And, and, and Gareth said, well, wait a minute, I'll just ring your mother. So he rang Joan, his mother, and said, uh, your son wants to borrow some blasting cues from me. <laughs> and she said, well, that's all right. And uh, he said, but you know what that means? It means he wants to try and blow something up. <laughs> and she said, well, for goodness sakes, he's just trying to express himself. <laughs> <laughs> There's enough time. So when I, when I look at my, my daughter, I made my daughter an exploding birthday cake the other day. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. But more and more we get pressed into, that, into that, um, that square frame. And that's not right for human beings. Uh, you know, we are not square, we're sort of raggedy and tattered at the edges. Um, right, so I'll leave you there. Good.